Socialist Society lunch, luncheon debate. Uh, our topic today is going to be resolved. The FCC does not have the legal authority to implement net neutrality. Uh, on the pro side of the debate, so taking the side that the FCC does not have the legal authority to implement net neutrality, we have Gus Hurwitz of the Nebraska College of the Law and Jeffrey Mann of the International Center for Law and Economics. Uh, opposing them on the other side is uh, Adam Kandub of Michigan State University School of Law and uh, Jim Speta of Northwestern University School of Law. So the way it's going to unfold, we're going to allow each side to talk for about 20 minutes. Um, they'll divide the time amongst themselves to decide uh, which of them is more persuasive to you. After, uh, after the uh, initial statements, we'll allow some crosstalk between the uh, participants, and then we'll open the floor to you folks for uh, questions from the audience. So I'm going to turn it over now to <coughs> Gus. OK. Um, so I, I know there's no better way to uh, go, go through lunch than with a lecture of sorts about uh, the modern history of telecommunications regulation. Um, I'm going to be starting with a little bit. <laughs> they're, they're back there applauding for this as well. Um, they're, they're applauding because they're not here to uh, hear this. Um, but we, we need to do some ground setting uh, since this is a, a pretty complex uh, and technical uh, topic. I'm going to try and uh, be uh, brief. I'm going to be setting the stage a bit, uh, then getting into our, Jeff and my's affirmative arguments for why the FCC does not have authority. Um, and I'd, I'd like to start by thanking Dan, who's actually pinch hitting here for Todd Henderson, who is homesick. And I'll note also, Jeff and I have a bit of a cold. So one lesson to take from this we is each that have a cold. we don't have one. Cold. Right. Uh, that <laughs> that uh, working in this field is likely to make you a little bit sick. I'd also like to uh, thank the earlier panel on Chevron for talking a great deal about Brand X. We're going to be talking a great deal about Brand X as well. Um, it is the uh, case that just keeps on giving. Um, so uh, a bit of a background here about what the FCC is doing with the open internet um, and uh, the regulatory questions. So the FCC, uh, the Federal Communications <coughs> Commission, gets most of its statutory authority, its statutory authority uh, relevant here, from two acts, the 1934 Communications Act and the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Um, the basic issue that we're going to be struggling with today gets into the classification of internet service. What type of service under these acts uh, internet service is. Um, and this goes back to a set of uh, documents, a set of inquiries that the Federal Communications Commission engaged in in the uh, 1960s through early 1980s called the Computer Inquiries under the Communications Act. And the result for the purposes of our discussion of these um, inquiries was that the Commission created um, a dichotomy between two types of services. Pure communication services, or what came to be known as telecommunication services. These were regulated services provided by the then monopoly AT&T. The idea was these were uh, the pure communications lines that did not offer any enhanced services, didn't alter or manipulate uh, the traffic um, at all. Uh, the other services were so-called inform uh, information services. These were unregulated competitive services that were being offered by companies at the time like AT&T um, that were developing uh, enhanced features that you could offer to consumers by means of, that were accessed by means of the pure communications and telecommunications services. So step forward a couple of decades, 1996, the 1996 Telecommunications Act codified this distinction between pure or telecommunication services and enhanced or information services, and it provided actual statutory text that defines what these actual services are. And guess what? The language of these, the statute is incredibly ambiguous. Not only is it ambiguous, it's circular. It uses telecommunication service to define what an information service is. Um, so it, it's completely unclear uh, how we actually um, interpret uh, this language. Um, so so we, we've got these two classifications uh, in the, uh, the statute. Um, around this same time, 1996, the internet was kind of starting to become a thing. And uh, there are two main technologies, wireline technologies, that we still use today to access the internet. Um, one is called DSL, Digital Subscriber Loop. This is an internet access service that is offered using the traditional telephone network. 
So this grew out of the services that were developed by AT&T that had for a long time been regulated under Title II of the Communications Act as a communication <coughs> service. So this had been regulated by the FCC for a long time under Title II. The other service uh, is cable-based internet service. And this had not been regulated under Title II. It kind of grew out of the cable infrastructure. It was unexpected in many ways uh, at the uh, time that the 96 Act was being uh, discussed. And there was a question, how should the FCC regulate this new cable-based internet service? Should it regulate it at all? Should there be parity between cable-based internet service and the telephone system DSL-based service? Um, so this led to a series of debates in the uh, late 1990s, um, and while the FCC was dragging its feet in these debates trying to figure out, hey, should we classify cable-based internet service as a telecom service or not, uh, this situation uh, that we spoke about uh, in the Chevron panel er earlier this morning happened. There was a uh, suit involving private litigants and uh, uh, the city of Oregon uh, where the appellate courts stepped in and were forced without input from the FCC to decide the question. And uh, the courts said, yeah, you know what? We're looking at this and we think that cable internet service, it is a Title II service. So they, the courts classified uh, cable internet as a Title II service and the FCC went ballistic. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is our ballywick. We get to decide this. So the FCC uh, uh, said, we think that cable internet is an information service, an unregulated service, a service that is not regulated, regulated under Title II. Uh, this gave rise to the Brand X case. So uh, as we spoke about this morning, uh, uh, Brand X is a hugely important administrative law case. Uh, the administrative law uh, question is whether or not agencies are bound by a court's construction of their ambiguous statute. Uh, the Supreme Court said, um, unless what the court has decided is that the statute is not ambiguous, no, agencies can adopt their own interpretation under Chevron of an ambiguous statute, even if the federal courts have already spoken to the question. And this was a 6-3 uh, decision um, uh, famously authored, the majority by uh, Justice Thomas, the uh, dissent by uh, um, Justice Scalia. was largely an administrative law opinion. I'm going to try and uh, speed this up uh, to make it even less coherent. Um, uh, so there, there were two important opinions here. The uh, majority, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> We're going to edit this part out, right? <laughs> so for everyone watching at home, good news, we are not burning to death. Um, well, at, least, at least not. Uh, yes. Not um, literally. So, uh, <clears throat> we're not burning to death, but we're not allowed to proceed either. <laughs> yeah, yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna try and get going again. Uh, so, in, in the uh, majority opinion, the majority opinion in Brand X aside from the administrative law issue, on the substantive telecom issue, they, uh, under Chevron step two, found that the FCC's determination that cable internet service is an information service was reasonable. It was at the outer bounds of what was reasonable or uh, permissible, um, but they said, okay, we're going to let the FCC get away with this. Uh, Justice Scalia in the dissent said, 
no, this is not permissible. Clearly broadband internet service. This is a Title II service. This is the same thing I was regulating when I was in the Nixon White House. Nothing has changed since the 60s. Um, this is clearly a Title II service. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to uh, Brand X a bit, but the uh, uh, key takeaways at this point First, the Supreme Court said the definition of telecommunications service is clearly ambiguous. There's no question this is ambiguous. And the other takeaway is all nine justices appeared to be comfortable with saying that uh, broadband internet access service is a Title II service, that the FCC could regulate it under Title II. Um, a lot of nuance needs to be added to that from Maya and Jeff's perspectives because we don't like that conclusion. <laughs> um, so uh, after uh, Brand X, the F FCC said, okay, now uh, cable internet is an information service. We want parity here. They reclassified DSL as an information service. As of 2005, all internet access service was unregulated. It was not regulated under Title II. Um, Around the same time, 2002, 2003, um, uh, an academic, uh, Tim Wu, started writing about this thing called net neutrality. We need to be careful how we characterize uh, what Tim said because he's currently uh, in the New York Attorney General's office and we don't want him, uh, well, that might be what happened yeah, exactly. here. Um, <laughs> uh, Generally, the, the concern of net neutrality is uh, the concern is that internet service providers are going to interfere with traffic flowing over their networks for various nefarious purposes. The uh, general concern is this will be anti-competitive conduct. So if you are a DSL-based ISP, you also offer telephone service, so you're going to slow down voice over IP service. Yeah. If you are a cable-based ISP or nowadays a fiber-based ISP, you also probably offer video service. So you're going to slow down and degrade other video services like Netflix for uh, nefarious anti-competitive reasons that could easily be addressed by the antitrust laws. I apologize to my opponents. I'm trying to be fair and neutral here. Uh, I'm having some trouble. Um, uh, so the question of net neutrality is what uh, can, what should the FCC do about the concerns? Um, and that's what we're debating today, um, what the FCC uh, can do about them. So the FCC, following the reclassification of DSL, took a couple of approaches. First, uh, or they took a couple swings uh, at bat here. First, they issued a policy statement uh, that put forth a few principles, basically saying ISPs don't do this stuff. Um, this was challenged in the D.C. Circuit when the FCC tried to enforce this policy statement against Comcast um, for throttling video, for throttling a BitTorrent traffic that was primarily used to distribute video. And the D.C. Circuit said, hey, FCC, you don't have a legal basis for this. In fact, the legal basis that you're pointing to, part of the statute called Section 706, in 1998 you said, isn't a basis for regulating the internet. Section 706, you said, is not an independent grant of authority. So uh, the DC Circuit in 2007 threw out the policy statement. So the second swing at the bat, the FCC issued uh, its first open internet order in 2010, where uh, they said, we changed our mind about uh, Section 706. We're revising our uh, 1998 order and saying that it is an independent grant of authority. Um, this was challenged again in the D.C. Circuit, and uh, the uh, FCC prevailed on this question of authority under Section 706. Um, the uh, D.C. Circuit said, yes, you can, under Chevron, interpret Section 706 as a grant of uh, authority, but, important but, um, you still are saying this is an information service, and those statutory definitions of information and telecom service actually expressly say that you cannot subject a non-common carrier, that is an information service, to common carrier regulation. And the rules that the FCC implemented in its first internet order, the DC Circuit said, amounted to common carrier regulation. So they said, Section 706 gives you some authority, but you can't use it to do common carrier style regulation. Uh, so the uh, DC Circuit uh, remanded this back down to the FCC. The FCC uh, just uh, in 2015, I guess that's last year now, um, released uh, its latest revision of the open internet order where they still use section 706, but the bigger thing that they did is they reclassified internet access service as a Title II telecommunications service. 
and in so doing, um, they argue that uh, they can impose common carrier regulations because they have uh, classified this as a common carriage service on broadband internet access uh, service. Um, so uh, that, that's where we'll finish this background. Uh, this is really the uh, discussion that uh, we're having here today. Is it appropriate for the commission to classify um, broadband internet access service or the internet generally, we're going to get into that, as Title II for the purposes of uh, imp uh, imposing uh, these regulations? Um, unfortunately, I'm going to keep talking for a moment. Uh, as uh, we get into Jeff and Mai's uh, affirmative arguments that the FCC does not have substantive authority, even under Title II, to implement uh, its open internet rules. So the FCC bases its primary case in Brand X. Unsurprisingly, all nine justices seem to indicate that they were comfortable with the idea of regulating internet access under Title II. Um, in fact, if you read their briefs and if you uh, listen to oral arguments, this is the first thing uh, that they say <coughs> in the uh, briefs. This is the first thing that their uh, general counsel, John Sallet, said at uh, oral arguments. This was the first question for uh, opposing counsel or the petitioners at oral arguments. Uh, is Brand X the starting point for this case? Um, uh, our response is no. yes. Well, Jeff's response is going to be no. But for the sake of argument, let's say it's the starting point. We'll we'll explain why it's actually not the starting point in a minute. Um, uh, Brand X is not controlling on this question. So uh, a, a couple of narrow points and some more general points about Brand X. Uh, the question in Brand X, what the court was considering, other than the administrative law question on the substantive telecom question, uh, the question was whether or not cable could be a information service. It was not whether or not cable and other internet access services could be Title II services. So this was not a question properly before the court. Um, it wasn't a question that was substantively briefed or that was uh, um, considered uh, directly by the court. So the statements that the court, that Justice Scalia makes about Title II, uh, they're largely dicta. Um, and to the extent that they were considered, they were only considered <coughs> to the uh, extent that Title II <coughs> focuses on the 1996 Act's unbundling provisions. So the court was thinking about some aspects of Title II, but it was a narrow set of issues, not general reclassification and imposition of the entire 1934 Act's Title II regime. Um, but even more important, even if Brand X were controlling, the uh, court's consideration of telecommunication services in Brand X only applied to the last mile. So what is the last mile? Um, the last mile is the portion of the uh, communications uh, line that goes from your carrier's facilities to your house, the customer's house. Um, once you get beyond the last mile, you have interconnection where uh, that connection connects to other networks. Then you have the other networks that carry data to the edge. So we can divide the uh, network into really four components. Uh, we can say five components. You've got the user at one far end. You've got the last mile. You've got the ISPs facilities that have all the interconnections to the other networks that take you to the edge. Title II regulation only focuses in Brand X on the, that last mile component. And, and just to be clear, the edge is, is you can think of as content providers. Just Netflix, Google, everyone else who's putting stuff on the internet more for intents and purposes, that's the edge. Right. Um, and I, I want to uh, quote <coughs> Justice Scalia here from Brand X. This is really important language that gets overlooked um, uh, in the net neutrality discussions. Justice Scalia says in his dissent, since the delivery service provided by cable, the broadband connection between the customer's computer and the cable company's computer processing facilities is downstream from the computer processing facilities, there is no question that it merely serves as a conduit for the information services that have already been assembled by the cable company in its capacity as ISP. So since this is just the last mile uh, component, it's OK to regulate this as Title II. But he uses the term information services to characterize what the ISP is doing and the stuff that comes to the ISP. So Justice Scalia is actually saying that the broader internet, that the routing intelligence and logic uh, that the ISP is implementing is an information service. Um, so 
Jeff and I are, are this is a debate, we're willing to concede, we're willing to accept that the last mile component of the network can be regulated under Title II. And that means that Title II's unbundling provisions, for instance, the FCC in principle could impose upon cable networks. But the open internet order goes well beyond that. Um, while it technically does not classify uh, the broader internet as a Title II service or regulate the, title, uh, the broader internet as Title II, um, it uh, does a weird sort of uh, judo flip where uh, the language that they use is they say that uh, the ISP's interconnection agreements, their relationships with edge providers, all those agreements are, quote, subsumed within the common carriage contract that the ISP has with its customer. So this means I'm the ISP, Jeff is my customer. Um, we have a common carriage agreement here. Because of this contract, because of this agreement, all of my dealings with the rest of the world are subject to Title II obligations, even though the FCC hasn't characterized this as Title II. Um, so uh, hasn't, just to be clear, hasn't characterized the regulation of, of the rest of the internet as, as Title II, right? I mean, maybe this is clear, but just to... to so the FCC runs into the same problem that it ran into in Verizon. They are subjecting all these other agreements to common carriage obligations, even though they have said these are not Title II common carriage obligations. The problem that the uh, uh, court had with the FCC in Verizon was you are subjecting non-common carriers to common carriage obligations. The statute says you can't do that. So statutorily speaking, this is our problem with Title II regulation. But we have even bigger problems, for which I'm going to uh, hand over to Jeff. The bigger problem, yeah. 99? Uh, OK. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to condense my 17 pages of notes into three minutes of talk, really. No, I'm not. OK, so the bigger issue, as uh, Gus intimated, is uh, with respect to the FCC's authority. <clears throat> The 34 Act, uh, which is, which is from, from which Title II uh, arises, uh, as, as I think Gus suggested, is, was designed for monopoly telephone services. Right off the bat, we're talking about something that is um, different in both the most important respects from broadband, which is neither a monopoly service nor a telephone service. In 1996, uh, as, as Gus suggested, Congress uh, revised the 34 Act, and very clearly for, for the purpose of deregulating. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There was some recognition of technological change. Uh, the internet was still pretty nascent at the, at the time. The, the drafters of the 96 Act did not foresee uh, uh, digital uh, transmission, the IP revolution. Uh, I believe that they more or less contemplated sort of an analog uh, market for eternity, but they also contemplated far more competition than they had previously. Um, and uh, they did mention the internet in one place. L literally, what, there's one other mention that's completely irrelevant to this, but really in one place in, the, in all of the 96 Act is the internet mentioned. We think that would be pretty important here, right? If, um, and if that says anything, uh, about what the FCC is trying to do, the one place where the internet is mentioned, you know, we think that would be be important. Here's what it says when it mentions the internet in the one place in the 96 Act where it does. It is the policy of the United States to preserve the vibrant and competitive free market that presently exists for the internet and other interactive computer services unfettered by federal or state regulation. The DC Circuit read that language the same way I do, and all of us probably do, uh, and reiterated that the Telecommunications Act purpose is reducing regulation in order to encourage the rapid deployment of new telecommunication technologies. Right? It's a deregulatory um, uh, act. Not only, by the way, is the aim expressly deregulatory, but from the way it's worded, it acknowledges that uh, the internet market, the broadband access market, is competitive and that it is distinct from the telecom networks being regulated elsewhere in the 34 and 96 acts. Okay. One could argue the 96 act was pretty successful. Today there's an, actually a, an enormous amount of competition, far more competition than, uh, than uh, net neutrality sort of pro proponents uh, acknowledge. Frankly, far more competition than the FCC acknowledges. 
actually I should say, when it suited them, they were happy to acknowledge there was lots of competition. When it came time to start justifying the uh, open internet order, um, all of a sudden, miraculously, in the reports, the, the level of competition was dramatically decreasing. And, and uh, anyway, everyone actually understands there's enormous amount of competition here. Um, <coughs> okay, so. Uh, we're, we're speaking for our opponents as well. <laughs> yeah, when I say everyone, I mean those guys, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so now, now what we have is the FCC using an old statute, right, the, the 34 Act, designed to regulate something that is essentially a, a world that is no longer in existence, to regulate this competitive industry using a very different technology with different competitive standards. <clears throat> it's unlikely, to say the least, uh, that the explicit statement that the internet should remain unfettered by federal regulation also somehow contemplates an implicit delegation to the FCC of the authority to regulate the internet under the Act's most onerous common carriage provisions, um, right? This is not a, a pure legal standard. This is um, this is the you know the logic standard, the, the reasonable man standard. Right? Uh, but doing so isn't just bad policy. It also violates the agency's statutory authority. Okay. Um, two minutes to cover the entirety of the of the order. Sure, no problem. Um, <laughs> The scope of the order is limited, argue, uh, excuse me, um, uh, purportedly to the last mile. Un understanding that Brand X was going to be how they justified what they were doing, limiting er everything to the, the last mile. But as Gus pointed out, the state of ob stated objectives of the order and the way that and, and what it's intended to do and the way it does it go well beyond uh, just the last mile. Um, <clears throat> as a uh, let's see, in fact. The whole order is premised on regulation of the edge. The whole justification for the order is, is the um, uh, uh, protection of competition, free expression, and, and the like for content providers, yeah, not the, the, for last mile access, which... The, the, the first sentence of the order, the open internet drives the American economy and serves every day as a critical tool for American citizens to conduct commerce, communicate, educate, entertain, and engage the world around them. This isn't making a phone call. This is something far broader than a fire alarm can control. That's actually probably running over a... Uh, just disregard what I'm saying. <laughs> so what do we do? OK, so uh, as a technological matter, um, it's actually impossible. I, I, we would argue, for the FCC to do what it wants to do, to actually separate uh, uh, the transmission service from the, the edge, the content, the stuff that they, that they really want to uh, regulate. That was also discussed in Brand X, and, and Scalia, with his Nixon era knowledge of uh, telecommunications, understood that actually they, they could be separated. So the, the last thing that we will say, um, and this is important to get out, Really, the framing that I think Jeff and I would propose for how to think about the agency's authority and this case is this is a major questions case. Okay. Um, and this ties into our discussion from earlier today. And this, frankly, is why this should be a topic of interest to everyone in this room. This could be very easily Supreme Court track litigation. That could be a important framing of the major questions doctrine. So we should all be ready to understand and think about it in that context. Can I say something more about the major questions? No. <laughs> I, our, our moderator. Will Save it for Q&A. Uh -huh. uh -huh. All right, Adam? Are you, you're going to go ahead. Um, take, we've decided I'm going to jump in. Um, uh, I appreciate the, um, the announcements because it, uh, it, it, it's reflective of the underlying logic that an associate dean deals with every day. So um, uh, the thing about the 1934 Act and the 1996 Act to a lesser extent is that it is the pinnacle of a Landisian administrative law scheme. It sees an industry called communications and it delegates the authority to the FCC to regulate that thing called communications. <clears throat> the history of FCC attempts to regulate new technologies is a history in which when the FCC has decided to regulate a new technology, the courts have said fine. In the 1970s, in the case that's of interest to those of us in Chicago, a group of petitioners asked the FCC to block the construction of the Sears Tower because it would create too many shadows in television service. 
No one apparently figured out what would actually happen as the television antennas would go on top of the Sears Tower. <laughs> um, the FCC in that case said no. And the court said, OK, yeah, you don't have authority to, to regulate the construction of the Sears Tower. But in a time in which the Communications Act did not mention cable television, the Supreme Court was quite all right with the FCC deciding to regulate cable television. Um, and in a time in which um, uh, Title I authority to regulate um, was necessary so that um, the deregulation that preceded 1996, the deregulation that was necessary due to the entry of MCI and Sprint back in the day, um, the court said, OK, you can have authority under, the, under Title I to prevent the states, for example, from regulating where you, the FCC, have decided that there should be no regulation under Title I. We will allow you to say that a service is not a common carrier service for the purposes of deregulating it and also use Title I authority to say that the states cannot regulate it. So the history of this Landisian administrative law statute is one in which um, the authority of the FCC to regulate new public communications technologies is um, virtually without exception. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about the general themes that Jeff mostly hit on, and then um, my partner Adam here will speak specifically to the FCC's justification in its most recent order, that is that, in fact, internet service is a common carrier service, and therefore, there is a regulatory delegation of the strongest sort um, in Title II of the Communications Act to regulate. Jeff starts in 1934, and all good stories about um, telecommunications regulation should start, well, if not in 1910 with the Mann-Elkins Act, at least in 1934 with the Communications Act. Um, but I think it is a construct of our straining for logic that we as quasi-economists or real economists would like there to be in a regulatory statute to say that the 1934 Act was designed for regulation of monopoly telephone service. That's simply ahistoric. At the time, there was enormous amounts of local and inefficient competition in telecommunications. The city of Chicago had four local, telecommunication, local telephone companies. Um, and throughout the history of Title II, whether it was um, from, the from the consolidation to the later introduction of MCI and the later introduction of Sprint and other services into the core of the telecommunications network, there's been very little association, at least as a legal matter, between the regulatory authority that the FCC has over telecommunication services and whether there is competition or not in cases such as um, uh, the de-tariffing cases and others from the Supreme Court um, uh, are in that theme. Now, he's no doubt right that the 1996 Act was intended to deregulate um, in many regards um, parts of the communications network that had been um, uh, 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 previously regulated. Um, but I think it's also a little bit ahistoric to say that there's nothing in the 1996 Act to suggest that the FCC has been given regulatory authority um, uh, to address the internet. And so um, the provision that they have previously talked about, Section 706 of the um, uh, 1996 Act, which is codified at Section 1302 um, of Title 47, does not, of course, use um, the word internet. Um, neither does the entire title of the 1996 Act, which was intended to regulate pornography on the internet, um, use the word internet. But clearly, internet was um, used. But Section 706 does address uh, a service denominated as, quote, advanced telecommunications capability. And it defines that service as a high-speed switched broadband telecommunications capability that enables users to originate and receive high-quality voice data graphics and video telecommunications using any technology. That sounds like the internet to me. So we have Section 706 defining advanced telecommunications capability in a way that doesn't depend upon the characteristics of common carriage, right? It points at broadband. It says people use this for video and other things. This is what <clears throat> we're talking about. <clears throat> and then the previous subsections of Section 706, which used to be on my screen here, and there they are, um, the FCC is given regulatory authority to do things with respect to advanced telecommunications capability. The Commission shall encourage the deployment on a reasonable and timely basis of advanced telecommunications capabilities to all Americans by utilizing regulatory methods that remove barriers to infrastructure investment. In the second subsection, subsection B, if the Commission's determination that all 
Americans do not yet have adequate capability of advanced telecommunications, the Commission shall take immediate action to accelerate deployment of such capability by removing barriers to infrastructure investment and by promoting competition into the telecommunications market. Now, both Jeff and I agree that that language is largely deregulatory. It refers to the use of techniques such as price cap regulations, et cetera, which at the time of 1996 were clearly thought to be deregulatory. But the objection to the use of Section 706 authority, and there can be no doubt that Section 706 is a grant of regulatory authority, appears to be the idea that net neutrality regulation is not regulation that, quote, removes barriers to infrastructure investment, close quote, or that, quote, promotes competition in the telecommunications market, close quote. And that may be a plausible objection to the FCC's um, action under that section, but the FCC specifically made a finding that net neutrality was regulation that accomplished those two purposes. Um, and in the absence of more specific guidance from Congress, it's clearly the FCC's job to decide um, uh, what to do with this um, uh, regulatory <laughs> provision. Now, it is true that in the Verizon case, the D.C. Circuit decided that the FCC could not rely on Section 706 <laughs> to impose the open Internet rules. But I think that part of the decision was probably wrong in that it conflates any type of non-discrimination regulation, any type of net neutrality regulation, with common carrier regulation, which, of course, is the key language in the prohibitory definition um, on which the court and um, uh, Jeff and, and Gus rely. The statutory language at issue does forbid common carrier regulation of those services which are not common carrier services. But the definition of common carriage regulation in telecommunications law, albeit circular to some degree, has always had two characteristics. The first of which is that it's largely a public service. But the second of which is that the intelligence carried over the network is intelligence um, that is uh, of, sorry, uh, trans that allows customers to transmit intelligence of their own design and choosing. Well, the FCC had held, and it had been affirmed in Brand X, that transmission of, uh, that that's not what the internet did. It did not merely transmit intelligence of their own design and choosing. And so the Verizon move to conflate any non-discrimination regulation uh, on a service that is held open to the public seems to me to cast too broadly, or at least cast to, um, uh, at, at least I think there's a good argument that Section 706 um, permits the FCC to walk up to the line of common carriage. And of course, under this Landisian statute, it's the FCC's job to define where that line is. And it was the FCC's position that what we were doing with respect to the open internet order was not full-blown common carriage. In fact, that's the FCC's uh, view today. We're using common carrier regulation, but we're not doing um, uh, uh, common carriage. So to conclude, no one's waving a sign at me yet, but I'll, I'll conclude. <clears throat> um, to return in part to where I started, the FCC is the network regulator for public networks. And the underlying characteristics of the internet are fairly similar to those of the traditional telecommunications network, as my partner Adam will get into in talking about Title II authority particularly. There are significant concentration in the infrastructure, significant network benefits, some externalities, and significant public benefits to be had from interconnection regulation. It's hard to imagine, under this Landisian statute, conceived as broadly as it historically has been, that this does not include the ability to regulate the internet in the public interest. Good. Well, you know, the network neutrality debate is, is unusual. Um, it attracted four million comments to the FCC um, in the last rulemaking, which is more than it had received in the last eight years. <laughs> Um, and it's been a topic of a lot of um, late night comic routines. Jimmy Fallon has a really funny network neutrality a skit. Jennifer Owens did it on Saturday Night Live. And you would think that network neutrality is interesting and fascinating and a lot of fun to talk about. Um, <laughs> as the fourth guy on a post-prandial panel um, who is now going to do a little statutory interpretation, I would beg to differ. Um, this, this it is a tedious um, statute. A lot of it is a, a tedious statutory uh, 
an analysis and an issue, and, and that's the way I think the courts will decide it. Um, and that's very separate from the, the policy issues, which I think everyone on this panel agrees with, that we look with dread um, with what the FCC is going to come up with with its newfound authority. Uh, and I think even the FCC is fearful because it really, um, it, it doesn't have the institutional capacity to make the sort of economic judgments that it thinks it does. So it's going to be a, an interesting ride. But nonetheless, that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not um, the order that was produced in the last year is, is lawful, and I think it is. Um, and it's a really quick, short argument, um, right out of Chevron, uh, and uh, it, it goes sort of like this, if I can find my new paper. There it is. Okay. So, uh, the statutes that control whether or not uh, the internet can be regulated as a common carrier were, is 1996 Telecommunications Act, which injected into the 34 Act a bunch of definitions as to what a telecommunication service is, what an information service is. And to quote um, a leading scholar, um, one of my favorite scholars in the area, um, Professor Gus Hurwitz from uh, Nebraska College, <laughs> they're totally unclear definitions, and they are. Uh, and one could easily have a very reasonable understanding of uh, broadband internet access as coming under common carriage title to regulation. And I, I can't believe I'm actually going to quote statute at a, you know, at a luncheon, but uh, did. you did, yeah, exactly. You Blame him. I'm just copying him. Uh, but the, the definition of, of information service is, you know, here we go, I'm going to fall asleep. The term information service means the offering of a capability for generating, acquiring, storing, transforming, processing, retrieving, utilizing, or making available information via telecommunications. Now, whether or not that definition was put together after the third round of martinis at the Palms, you know, um, it clearly references telecommunications. Um, and if, if someone's offering telecommunications, then under the statute, you can be considered a common carrier, and therefore all the yuckiness of the Title II comes in. And this is certainly a reasonable interpretation. Um, the, the one that the FCC actually adopted in, we forget this, in 1998 when it classified DSL. Um, and it said, oh, this is uh, regulatable under Title II. Um, it changed its mind in 2002 and then again changed it again last year. But it was certainly always a, a reasonable possibility. As, um, again, the distinguished um, uh, Professor Hurwitz said, most justices in Brand X believe that it was a Title II. The Ninth Circuit also agreed it was a, a Title II service. So it, it's clearly, I think, a reasonable um, uh, interpretation that would, would pass Chevron. Whether or not it's a good idea, I, that's a panel for, you know, you could stomach another debate on network neutrality. That's for next time. <coughs> Although I don't think anyone in this group would probably say, yes, that's a great idea. Um, uh, and uh, furthermore, I, I do want to say a little bit, of, again, a little bit in, in the weeds, uh, having to do with the history of telecommunication. Um, it, one of the sort of memes that I think was adopted in the Brand X opinion, which I don't think is actually correct, is that under the old 34 Act, before 1996, where they changed things by injecting all these crazy definitions, as, uh, as was pointed out, really for the purposes of local competition, uh, the, the FCC decided no, there's going to be this thing called question. basic telecommunications, and then there's going to, going to be this other category called enhanced uh, uh, communications, or enhanced services. Uh, and these sort of evolved into telecommunications and information services. But there was never an un a great understanding of what these terms meant at the FCC. Enhanced services included all sorts of things, like PBX, which was sort of private networks for big companies, um, call waiting, uh, voicemail, all these things that weren't plain old telephone services. So um, there never was this clear distinction where information or enhanced services are not regulated, but basic is. Um, rather, the FCC always claimed jurisdiction over all of it, but in its great bureaucratic wisdom said, look, we're not going to deal with this. But if, yeah, <laughs> cheers from the private sector. Um, and uh, we're not going to deal with this. But they always claimed that they, they, they never gave away uh, the jurisdiction over that. And I think that's, that was, um, uh, that concept was repeated in the structure of the 96 Act, which as I pointed out, was never talked about the internet, but introduced these terms of telecommunications, information services, 
which tracked these older regulatory terms, but which really had very little to do, I would say, with jurisdiction in that there was no clear statement, in this, or really any statement, that um, uh, internet, uh, broadband internet access or internet access of any, si any kind would be beyond the, um, the purview of FCC jurisdiction. Last point, and I, I, will, I, will, be, I will be brief, I, we're all, all tired. Um, it's a point that uh, the other side brings up and uh, to, which I can, to which I concur. The potential breadth of the new FCC order is huge. Uh, it, it can claim jurisdiction over arguably applications, over the whole, um, over huge amounts of the, the backbone of uh, areas where it has never dealt with before. Uh, and I actually believe that the FCC probably is on firm ground when it claims this jurisdiction. Uh, because, as, as um, uh, Jim pointed out, the 34 Act is essentially an all-encompassing act. It, it, it gets everything that all wire and radio communications. And if we want that to change, it really has to, you know, if we want to change permanently so that regardless of who's in, in the White House, um, this threat over the internet will, will go away, um, there has to be some statutory tension. So that's it. Thanks. So I think given our truncated time, rather than uh, offer a lot of crosstalk between the two, what I'd like to do is give each of you a couple minutes to respond to the other side's argument and then open the floor to questions. So okay. you guys? Okay. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, I find it fascinating that my colleague to the far left <laughs> started his comments by uh, explaining that the 34 Act delegated to the FCC power to regulate this thing called communications. And I, I think that that is the argument that the commission actually makes. In fact, uh, in the uh, Verizon uh, opinion, uh, they, in the Verizon case, they argued that, and in the uh, 2015 order, they argue that section 706A and section 706B are each independent grants of authority, and the only limiting principle that has been identified for section 706A is that regulations adopted under it be uh, r relating to interstate communications by wire or a radio. So they're effectively saying we can regulate interstate communications by wire or radio in the public interest. That is our statutory mandate. That is exactly, uh, in effect, what Jim said they get to do in the case of new technologies. Well, the question is why do we have a couple hundred pages of really dense technical statute then? Um, uh, th that, that is, I think, in effect, what the argument, however, uh, being made is. And this is uh, what uh, Adam is echoing, I think, that the uh, agency's mandate is very broad on this understanding. And th this echoes a conversation from this morning again. Um, uh, there was some discussion uh, and citation to uh, Jody Friedman's um, Old Statutes, New Problems article. Um, the question is, when you have these new technologies and really old statutes and a Congress that isn't updating the statutes to the new technologies, do we say we are going to defer to the expert agencies to keep the machinery of government rolling, knowing that might slow down and preempt the Congress from ever acting, or do we instead say, no, the agencies can't regulate these new areas, we're going to force Congress to act. So this is why uh, we, we think of this as a major question sort of issue. And the fundamental question here is, what is the thing being regulated? Is this the broad internet? Is this the entire ecosystem? I'll be quiet now. So uh, I was going to start with what he ended with, so that's convenient. Uh, uh, it is precisely for the, the reason that there is essentially no limiting principle in the FCC's interpretation of its statute uh, that we think this is a major questions problem and one that's, that is, is uh, uh, ripe for um, uh, a reversal, I guess, probably not by the DC Circuit, but possibly by the Supreme Court. Um, as was mentioned in the, uh, earlier, you could also call this a, a, a non-delegation problem, uh, if, if you were so inclined. Um, but the point is that the, the, the relevant understanding here is that their interpretation of the act required interpretation of the act in order to justify what they were doing, essentially means that Congress told, if they're right, told the <laughs> FCC, you can do whatever you want as long as it relates to communications. I don't think that that's a sufficient, oh, oh, sorry, and is in the public interest. And believe me, the public interest test is no limitation whatsoever um, if uh, the entire history of the FCC is any guide. Um, so uh, 
that strikes us as particularly problematic, particularly fitting with the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the major uh, questions doctrine, which is why the Chevron question isn't, isn't perhaps isn't even relevant at all. We, we, we don't need to get to Chevron. We don't need to get to the question of uh, whether they deserve deference uh, or not. Um, it is the court's obligation, essentially, in, in an issue that's so important. Oh, sorry, and, and uh, this is what I wanted to say first was, um, there's no question either that whether we're talking about the, we're going back to 34 or, or or 96 that you know I mean this is the problem here is clearly Congress's not not the FCC well also the FCC's but it's really not the FCC's problem it's Congress's and this act just it doesn't fit our our technological and economic reality today and. Um, uh, what the FCC is doing is, is basically trying to maintain its relevance in a world in which the statute that it operates under doesn't really, it was not, I mean, it was clearly not intended to govern what the FCC is, is trying to have it govern. But unfortunately, that's where everything the FCC used to regulate has moved. That, I mean, that's the world we live in. And unless and until Congress you know, actually updates the statutes, they're gonna be shoehorning or bootstrapping, whatever, maybe both. Um, uh, uh, their ability to stay relevant in, in, in you know, most of the communications world uh, into a statute that, that actually wasn't, wasn't ever meant for that, which again is another reason why um, uh, there's no strong basis for, for deferring to, to its interpretation. There's, there's a very strong basis for... Uh, for um, Fear. Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Which apparently we all agree on, right? We all agree we should fear what could come out of this. Rebuttal, Jim? So, um, so let me say this in the, in the vein of I'm no longer trying to win the debate, um, which is um, I'm on record that this is a major questions case, I think, in an article as early as 2000, and said that on the basis of cases like Brown and Williamson, the FCC doesn't have authority under most of the statutes that I pointed at in my opening statement to do what it said. On the other hand, this general idea that this is a Landisian regulatory statute is going to be relevant in answering the step zero and step one question mm -hmm. for what's really at issue right now, which mm -hmm. is, is internet service a common carrier service, okay? And the technical, the definition of a common carrier service does not say it's a common carrier service if it needs to be regulated because it's a monopoly. It doesn't say it's a common carrier service if it needs to be regulated because there's an externality problem or something like that. A common carrier service is a common carrier service if it's a public communication service, that is it's offered to the public generally or some subset of the population such that it's generally offered to people in a category without discrimination among people. And if the users who use that service are in charge of the content that flies over that service in terms of I decide to call my mom in Chicago, she, I say what I want to to my mom and she hears it and my mom says it back to me. That's what the internet does, folks. So can, right. can I ask a question? That is this? absolutely what the internet does. Um, and all this fancy stuff about routing and DNS, et cetera, is just a misunderstanding of how the telecommunications network works. We need a DNS system to translate google.com into the actual IP <clears throat> address. The phone in your home doesn't have that phone number on it as far as the network's concerned. There's a table that maps that phone number that's currently assigned to your house into something that's called a common language and line indicator, a silly code in the language. So it's exactly the same technology. And so when I, the FCC wakes up and says, you know what, we've been wrong for 10 years. This actually is a common carrier communication services. I think they're at the height of the sort of decision that the 34 Act says they ought to get de deference on. Um, and that's why I think they have regular, that's the real reason why I think they have regulatory authority. Yeah, well, actually, we may actually, we'll get a debate, but it's me against everybody. I don't think this, <laughs> I don't think this is a major, major issues case. Um, the internet was around in 96. Um, Congress maybe wasn't, but certainly <laughs> their, <laughs> their, their unwillingness to engage with reality is in itself a decision, uh, a legislative decision. Um, they stuck us with this, um, this very expansive um, uh, statute. And, you know, the Supreme Court in the past has been fine with big power grabs by 
the FCC. I have Southwestern Cable comes to mind, where you know just cable television never regulated, not mentioned anywhere in the, in the, in, in the statute, not even truly not in existence in 1934. Um, and yep. We can do it because we have to make sure that everyone has free television. That's so important. Um, so uh, I, I think that this is not actually not a good, a good or likely case for the Supreme Court to take up. And I, I hope they do. I hope I'm wrong. So that's a good way to end the debate. <laughs> right. so. so we have a few minutes left. I'd like to invite uh, questions from the audience. We have a microphone over here and one over here. Uh, if you want to queue up. Oh. Hi, guy. Good. Hi, uh, my name's Rob Frieden. I'm a professor at uh, Penn State University and a longstanding uh, student of network neutrality. And I, I share the concern about uh, the muscularity of Title II, the strength of Title II, the potential for mischief in interpreting Title II. So my sort of going in position is, you know, why did the commission have to go that route with such muscularity? And on the other hand, um, a recognition that Title II only prohibits unreasonable discrimination, unreasonable practices, and there's a whole body of law on common carriage as to what's reasonable and un, uh, unreasonable. So that takes me back to something that wasn't mentioned um, in terms of the sequence of cases, and that's called the Selco case. The Selco case involves uh, roaming, which is when you take your handset and use it outside your home area. The commission, I think, has a very big problem with um, Convergence, technological convergence, uh, and the fact that that device that we all have blends seamlessly basic services like voice communications and also data services. So you're using your smartphone as a computer just as much as you're using it as a telephone. Celco was a DC circuit case that said, in effect, even though when you use that cell phone device, that, that smartphone for data services, um, there has to be a, a duty to deal not necessarily a common carrier duty to deal, not necessarily uh, the same terms and conditions. It can be negotiated on a commercial basis, and if it's technologically infeasible, it doesn't have to happen. Why wasn't the Selco case and the Selco precedent something that the commission could have embraced knowing that the D.C. Circuit had embraced it? Is it just a functional inability to sort of deal with convergence, that it has to be either fish or fowl, it has to be common carriage, Title II, Title I, basic and enhanced. How would they, how would they embrace it and still, and still be able to ban paid prioritization, essentially? Well, you see, I don't have a problem yeah, with so, paid Well, you may prior. not have a problem with it, my, yeah. my, but, but my question is, so, so I think it would have been great if they had embraced mm -hmm. Selk. I think it would have been great if they, there was a lot of things they could have done beyond what they did. but. My, uh, my answer to your question, at least in part, is uh, is there was so much pressure, you know, from from lots of places, including the the White House, to put in place a ban on paid prioritization. That 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 alone, at least with respect to what had formerly been the non discrimination and no blocking rules, would would preclude reliance on the ability to to negotiate for commercial uh, commercially reasonable negotiation. Yeah, and Jeff's absolutely right. I mean, the, notwithstanding the way I described it in terms of, you know, common carrier test, this was done by way of backward inference, right? Right, They exactly. wanted to get to this non-discrimination rule that they had in mind, given where they had ended up with the Comcast case and the Verizon case in the D.C. Circuit, they knew the only way they could get there was through Title II, and so they decided to reclassify, right? Um, you know, that's the sort of dangerous thing that, that sort of holds this equal, that, that causes me to wonder about this equilibrium, right? In, in, in 2006 and 2005, a bunch of us worked pretty hard um, to try to get the Congress to rewrite the Communications Act along the lines of a more sort of antitrusty statute, right? And Senator DeMinton it, 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 it had a bill, et cetera. Um, but there wasn't enough traction for it because although the FCC had continued to regulate things as common carriage, it had really followed sort of the economic principle that Jeff has been um, uh, pushing, which is, well, if there's a competition, we're going to basically deregulate it, right? This is sort of a big breach in that way of approaching the way in which they had gone forward. So I, I don't know what's going to happen with the equilibrium, but you know, it was, it was totally results-oriented. Um, yeah. The classification was driven by where we wanted, where the FCC wanted to end up with the regulation. And it's important to note that at the outset, um, 
after Verizon, uh, Chairman Wheeler indicated that he was going to follow the uh, Verizon opinion and the, quote, roadmap set forth uh, by Judge Tatel, and he was going to use the Selco commercial uh, reasonableness standard. But then uh, politics got involved, and it became clear that they had to have a strong ban on paid prioritization, so they had to go the Title II route. Um, there's uh, an important exchange in the uh, D.C. Circuit um, arguments where Judge Tatel asked, um, in your own words, you call this a roadmap. Why didn't you follow it? And there's a, I, I just love this language from the order itself. Um, uh, the FCC explains that in the Verizon opinion, the DC circuit remanded the order because it concluded the commission had treated an information service as common carriage. We conclude now that the failure of the commission's analysis was a failure to explain to the court what the service ed to edge providers is, that the service to edge providers is subsumed within the promise made to the retail consumer of the broadband internet access service. So in the order, they say the reason this failed under, uh, in Verizon wasn't because our analysis was wrong, it's because we didn't explain it or you, the court, didn't understand what we were saying. I don't think that Judge, I, I think that that was in Judge Tatel's mind when he was asking, <laughs> why did you ignore what I said um, uh, um, in the DC Circuit hearing? Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Any questions? One up here. Uh, hi, I'm Larry Weiner from Arizona State. Where at this stage of uh, potential regulation would anybody think that First Amendment considerations ought to come into play? <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, uh, we, 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 have two hour, we have another two hours, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we, we agreed collectively not to talk about, to, uh, we, we put a restriction, a prior restraint on discussing the First Amendment on this panel. I can, <laughs> but I the can, question's I, been I asked. I can send you my paper on it. Uh, well, it, it's a really interesting question. So it, it, is, it was a uh, issue before the D.C. Circuit. One of the petitioners uh, did have this as an issue before the uh, court. So if the court uh, wants to uphold uh, the order, they're going to need to say something about the arguments that were raised about the First Amendment. My expectation is they'll say, Turner 2, it's really intermediate scrutiny, there's compelling interest, we don't want to talk about this. All right, but I, I it, it, it's it. lingering in the background. I don't think they'll address it. I'm sorry, they will address it to the extent they have to in order to uphold the order, assuming that's the way they come out. They won't address it at all if they have found other grounds to strike down the order, and if they address it, they will absolutely stay away from the editorial content sort of questions from, uh, I, I think, I mean, yeah. given, the, given this panel, I mean, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, I mean, the easiest way to deal with it is to say, First Amendment doesn't really apply to common carriers. If the FCC has, has um, Well, that they, that they can't say. What's that? I don't think they would want to say that. Well, they would go, I think they would go so far. I mean, that, that the FCC, uh, generally, there's a, the, the FCC, is, um, the First Amendment um, it does, you know, doesn't really, um, or well, rather, government can regulate common carriers. Um, in the sense that imposing non-discrimination requirements on them and that and just leave it at that and um, furthermore even if they went to Turner um, I mean, remember Turner was upheld uh, for intermediate scrutiny and the you know important government purpose was free television huh and uh, that um, uh, and, and that, that was the problem and that actually was a really very significant imposition because it was requiring cable televisions to carry programming that they didn't want to uh, I think that the FCC has already accepted uh, the, F uh, the, the DC Circuit, excuse me, has already accepted the FCC's uh, economic theory about possible foreclosure, and this is a serious issue we have to worry about, and would therefore probably, under that justification, accept it under an intermediate suit scrutiny. So. Other questions? Well, I can ask Jim yeah, a question. <laughs> sure. I got some questions. Go ahead, so, yeah. First, if, if I decide to agree with you guys, do I have to grow my hair out and grow a beard? Well, I, I was, I was going to say, I was going to point out, obviously taking this position is good for hair growth. So and the causal connection is obvious. That's why we put and, them on your left so, and the hippies. You, you can tell that I know the technology because I'm not wearing a tie. Um, more seriously, uh, do you think or do you, do you think that it will or do you think it should affect the analysis that the FCC is reversing its position? Um, you know, within the Chevron space. 
Do you think that's going to affect the analysis at all? Do you think it should affect the analysis at all in wh wh which way? Or, well, do they, or is it just as if they're writing on a blank slate? A little bit under Brandon Williamson, right? Um, uh, I can't remember the, the, the factors e exactly, but when they, but, but when, and, uh, maybe, not to point to people in the audience, but Adam, <laughs> right behind you, probably knows uh, offhand. But, but when, they, when they were discussing the regulation of tobacco under the uh, FDA Act, um, uh, things like uh, the, you know, the opportunity for, for Congress to, to regulate and a decision not to, um, but uh, among those, what I'm pretty sure was the, the reversal of uh, position by the agency itself. So, I mean, dispositive, <laughs> not at all. R you know, po possibly relevant. I mean, as you said, should it be relevant? Yeah, relevant, yes. Will it be? No. There's I, also, I, oh, I don't think ahead. it's very likely. I think it should I be. Know. I mean, it, it's one of the Skidmore factors, and, and if Skidmore deference is what you do at step zero, uh, you know, that. That was hot at the time, um, so I agree with that. Um, I think it should, um, but it's just too easy for the D.C. Circuit to point at Fox 2 yeah. and yeah, all of the other the cases thing. and say, all you need is a reason why you're doing what you're doing now. You don't need a reason why you're doing something different than you used to do. And clearly, uh, you, don't the, and clearly the, you don't have to have a good reason. You just have to have a reason. Yeah. I mean, the, but the, there, there is some discussion that uh, this the, the Fox question, Fox does have some language, you need to explain changed facts, and uh, if there is a substantial re reliance interest, you need to uh, respond to that. And it's not clear what that what those factors actually mean. So uh, it, uh, I don't, don't think this would get to the Supreme Court for clarification on those issues unless the D.C. Circuit does something crazy. Um, but it's unclear uh, what import uh, didn't, Fox factors could have. If, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. It didn't come up in oral argument at all, right? I mean, I mean, I mean but, this but whole I mean, line of, of, of oh yeah, yeah. No. Right. So I'll exercise the moderator's privilege to ask the last question, which is far too big for the time we have left. But my sense on the of the panel is one: it sounds like uh, the DC Circuit is probably going to uh, prove what the FCC did, and two: that's probably a bad idea from a policy perspective. So my question is, assuming that's what happens and the D.C. Circuit comes down with an opinion affirming the FCC, uh, what is next for the FCC? Does this open the door for regulation of uh, Internet-based content providers such as VoIP providers and um, online video and things like that? And where, what's the limiting principle going forward? <laughs> well, I'm going to start by objecting to the question because uh, I was uh, just last night um, re-listening to the oral arguments, and I, I was really impressed by the... A uh, level of technical detail from all three judges asking about basically this question are you regulating the broader internet or are you just regulating the last mile and I think there was a lot of skepticism so uh, I, I I'm not going to say I think it's an easy win I that the FCC is definitely going to lose but I uh, definitely would not say that I think the FCC is going to win Who the panel? what Who uh, the panel? Uh, Tate Ellis, and uh, Williams so I, I, I agree with with Gus, definitely, with respect, with respect to the, um, uh, it's not a certainty that the FCC wins. I, I think it's pretty likely, however, um, uh, s sadly. Uh, but, but I do think that um, the, you know, the, the point is, I mean, the point that we've been making, in fact, is that there isn't a, a, a limiting principle. If you, if you recall, we were, wasn't really relevant to the debate we've been having, but there are Parts of the open internet order, right, like the general conduct rule, the, the, the sort of assertion of authority over interconnection, for that matter, the paid prioritization rule, which are, are absolutely clearly um, applicable to, uh, to edge providers and to all kinds of behavior that we should all be worried about. Right? The best example is right now the, you know, the FCC is sending out letters to, to every ISP to uh, ask them, uh, in theory, with, with the, the possible objective in mind of stopping, uh, things like you know, T-Mobile's binge on uh, usage-based pricing, I mean, uh, 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 even hargating back to the days of when Metro PCS tried to introduce a service that, that, was subsidize, that would subsidize some content for, for you know, the relatively poor people so they could afford uh, service, I mean, it's pretty, as close as you can get to regulation of, of, of content, as close as you can get to 
a uh, essentially a, assuming they ban these things, of course they might not, but certainly they are asserting authority over them. And if they do ban them or or, or criticize them, um, it's the, like the, the the most uneconomic uh, uh, approach possible. It's a it, it, it's an ex ante you know, sort of per se um, condemnation of the very same conduct that in the the uh, link line decision was, was right was just uh, uh, or recently determined by the Supreme Court in the antitrust context to be to merit uh, uh, non per se condemnation right this ver you know this kind of vertical conduct so I, I think they they are would have the authority to and they're on a road towards something that we should all be really worried about so I I think the FCC will win I think the FCC should win on the question of whether this is the common carrier service. Um, I agree with what Gus and, and Jeff said in, in the vein of there's so much here that could upset the equilibrium that had seemed to obtain of really light regulation. And it's, it's you know, to, I would add to the examples Jeff's already given you uh, a notice that came out of the FCC um, to, def, to, to, to include in the definition of multi-channel video programming okay. distributor, what we think of as cable and DBS re systems. Um, People who are online streamers of video, even if they don't own any network infrastructure at all. So if I set up a server and I start streaming two channels of video 24-7, all of a sudden I have all the rights to demand access to broadcast programming, et cetera, et cetera, that cable companies do. That's, that's of the same order of upsetting the equilibrium. If those of equilibriums, equilibria tend to continue to get upset, um, and if the FCC goes, goes much farther, and the binge on proceeding and the other two pr the proceedings about um, uh, tiering are going to tell what this order really means. If the, if the order is sort of a you know, weak non-discrimination rule, it doesn't bum me out too much, um, and it's not going to upset the equilibrium. Adam? Yeah, and. Um Continuing on this, the chicken little uh, trend, uh, I, I agree. And the one point that didn't come out in the discussion is that the order itself is not really a rule. There's the pay prioritization, mm, sure. paid prioritization prohibition. It's the closest it comes to a rule. Most of this is going to be done by enforcement in subsequent adjudication. And so we have these very vague standards with a potential for getting into areas that the FCC never got involved in. And it's all going to be done by adjudicatory discretion, which I find, from a sort of libertarian <coughs> uh, perspective, very troubling. Um, this is in the wrong hands. It does have a potential of going selectively after certain types of uh, certain types of net out or net actors, and that raises concerns. And, and but th just to add one thing to that, not the the discretion, not even at the commission level. Yeah, that's right. right. Uh, Which is by the low level bureaucrats. Yeah, the sure. yeah. Yeah. So on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> you join me in thanking our panelists. Thanks. Thanks to you guys, not me.